I was an analyst, not an agent. Uh, in the 9-11, I led the analytical team uh, responsible for flight uh, 175, which was the second flight to hit the Trade Center. Uh, after that, I uh, left government, went into the think tank world, finally, 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 you'll appreciate, finally finished my PhD, uh, which was on the uh, impact of terrorist attacks on negotiation processes. And for my PhD, I studied acts of Jewish terrorism and acts of Islamist terrorism, both on the Oslo peace process, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Oslo peace process in the 1990s. Um, uh, founded a counterterrorism program at a Washington think tank, the Washington Institute uh, for Near East Policy, where I have come back each time I've left government, and I am now there again, uh, directing their counterterrorism and intelligence program and serving as a senior fellow. Uh, I then got recruited to go to the Treasury Department. After 9-11 in the United States, we had a lot of things that changed, including a lot of the bureaucracy. And one of the new parts of government that was created was a small part of the Treasury Department called Treasury's Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, which was responsible for tracking uh, illicit finance uh, related to whether it was the Iran nuclear program or Syria or North Korea related to nuclear issues. Of course, terrorism, whether it's Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah or now Islamic State, uh, Daesh, uh, and illicit financial crime as well, transnational organized crime. And I was recruited to be the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence. And that's a unique position um, because it is both a senior position within the Treasury Department, our finance ministry, but it is also uh, a position within the U.S. intelligence community. And so I was the deputy chief of one of the smaller U.S. intelligence agencies. Some of the work that we did was specifically and only for the intelligence community, including things, for example, for the president's daily brief. And other things were very much in support of policy, in support of, for example, uh, we began the campaign to constrict the uh, financing for Iran's nuclear program in 2005, 2006, 2007. And we provided a lot of information, much of it from intelligence, to support policymakers as they went around the world to Europe, to the Gulf, to Asia, to engage not only with governments, but sometimes, sometimes to the chagrin of those governments, directly with the private sector. So we would send Treasury officials to, say, Germany to meet with Deutsche Bank or Commerce Bank, not just with uh, officials in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, and now I'm back at the Washington Institute, out of government. Um, I've terminated all of my clearances, so nothing I can tell you, nothing that I know is from anything secret anymore, even though I was part of the intelligence community. I teach at Georgetown University and, uh, and get to travel around the world. So a week and a half ago, I was in Qatar, and today I am here, and in a week and a half, I will be in Peru. And what that means is that I get the pleasure of interacting with people, and when it's really fun, with students uh, from around the world. So that's kind of who I am. Let's talk a little bit about Iran in the context of, of terrorism and uh, regional activities within the region of the Middle East. I'll do that for a little bit. I'm going to try and say a few things that are at least a little bit controversial because sometimes I find university students get a little bit shy with the new speaker in a foreign language. And I'm going to try and make it so that that's not possible. I will say something that will annoy at least some of you on purpose. Whether or not I believe it, that's another issue, but I'm going to draw you out. Okay? And again, you don't need to agree with me. We want to have a conversation. Um, so, Iran is a complicated country. One could say that about any country, of course. But Iran is a particularly complicated country. Because when you want to study Iran, you need to study multiple different things. Obviously, like in any country, you need to study, kind of from a sociological perspective, the people. And of course, there are many different communities within Iran. There are many different types of people and, and things going on within society. I need to understand that. You need to understand that the Iranian people are not necessarily the same as the Iranian regime, and that there's actually a tremendous disconnect there in many ways. Disconnect in terms of politics, disconnect in terms of policies, some of the militant things that we're going to talk about, but also in other things. You see, for example, protests now with women.
understand the United States, you can't simply say Americans believe X. There's actually a lot of different opinions within American society on any given issue at any time, especially today. But with Iran, you have a different issue, which makes it still more complicated. And that is that when you try and understand the government, you have to understand at least parallel governments. One is the, I would describe it as kind of pseudo-elected leadership. The president, currently President Rouhani, the parliament, etc. And I say pseudo-elected because it's not a pure democracy. You have the expediency council, for example, which are unelected. They get to decide who gets to run. You saw during 2009, there were people running for president. The Supreme Leader didn't like some of those people running for president, so they were simply put under house arrest. Under a normal functioning democracy, under whatever rules there are for people being able to get maybe a sufficient number of votes to qualify, people can run for office without having to get the approval of the current ruling elite. Um, so that's why I call it pseudo-elected. And then you have the revolutionary leadership. The Supreme Leader, currently Ayatollah Khomeini, and others who are not elected, but are actually controlling all of the most critical levers of uh, authority within Iran. And so they are controlling both the formal military and the parallel military, by which I mean the uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps, including the Quds Force. So for example, in Iran, you have uh, an Iranian Navy, and then separately, you have the IRGC Navy, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy in parallel, um, and other parallel military entities like that. Uh, they control the media. They control the nuclear program. They control the ballistic missile program. They control the courts. None of those are controlled by the pseudo-elected leadership. So when you're understanding Iran, you have to understand both of these, and you have to understand which of these leadership structures are controlling the things that you, in particular, are studying. So, for example, if you are studying parliamentary politics in Iran, you could focus on the pseudo-elected side of government, because that's where the parliament sits. You may also be interested in the other part of government, the revolutionary leadership, in terms of some of the constraints within which the Iranian parliament operates. But you would primarily be focused within the side that is pseudo-elected. If you are focused on these issues, on conflict, on war, on terrorism, on support for proxies, military proxies in the region, then you are primarily focused on the revolutionary leadership, because they are the ones who are controlling those levels of power, and the uh, elected leadership is not. In fact, the U.S. intelligence community over the years, and this is declassified, I'm not telling you anything that remains secret. When it was first written, it was classified, but today it's not. The U.S. intelligence community, after previous presidents that were deemed as being more moderate than their predecessors, were elected in Iran, President Rafsanjani, uh, President Khatami, the U.S. intelligence community did an assessment and assessed that there may very well be areas in which these more moderate presidents could have more moderate policies in terms of negotiations with the West, in terms of freedoms domestically within the country, in terms of press freedoms, things like that. But then A, and then we're talking about two different assessments in two different times, of course, because Rosh Sanjani was president before Rouhani, but there were two different assessments, and they both came out saying that the president, A, while moderate in some areas, does not disagree, or at least does not disagree in whole with the revolutionary leadership on things like continued support, financial support, providing weapons, providing training and intelligence support to groups like Lebanese Hezbollah, or to groups at the time like the Badr Corps, uh, Shia Iraqi groups that at the time were fighting Saddam Hussein, now are part of the Shia militant groups uh, involved within the Popular Mobilization Forces, the PMF, the Hafs al Shabi uh, in Iraq. And that even if they did,
have a disagreement over support of such groups, which they did not, was the assessment. But even if they did, they are not in a position to be able to do anything about it. Because again, they don't control the levels, levers of authority and power over those relationships. There are other things you need to understand within Iran as well. First of all, the nature of this revolutionary leadership as opposed to the pseudo-elected. The pseudo-elected leadership, I think it's fair to say, is more interested in governance than it is in ideology, in the nature of the revolution, in preserving the revolution, and in exporting that revolution. Sorry, that's in Washington, everybody's waking up. That's my son. He called me to say good morning. Remind me to call him when we're done. Um, on the flip side, the revolutionary leadership, while not unconcerned with governance, of course they are concerned with governance, even if only because if you <clears throat> don't engage in some level of good governance, People are going to get angry and you're going to have discontent within society. But they are primarily focused on the concept of the maintenance of the revolution, which came in 1979. Now, the way that has happened over time has shifted. If you think about your relationships to your parents, to your siblings, to your friends, all relationships fluctuate over time. Hopefully, they fluctuate within, within a healthy range, right? and they stay in a, in a stable way, but they fluctuate over time. Similarly, over time, the nature, the how Iran has pursued uh, the maintenance of the revolution at home and the pursuit of the revolution, the export of the revolution abroad, has changed. In the first years after the revolution in Iran in 1979, it was very, very aggressive. And Iran created entire agencies and departments of government for the express purpose of exporting this revolution. The revolution was never intended to end at the borders of Iran. That got interrupted. What did it get interrupted by? Anybody? What happened shortly after the revolution in Iran? Major event which has shaped the threat perception of all Iranians, whether they have, are of a revolutionary ilk or not, what was that? The Iran-Iraq War. And so suddenly, having been invaded by Iraq, Iran had a completely different, immediate, existential threat. And this idea of exporting the revolution was not entirely, but almost entirely, put on the back burner. And so over the course of the uh, Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, instead of going at full tilt and very aggressively um, with a lot of effort and money and, and uh, agencies and departments exporting the revolution, Iran had to do that kind of as a side project while he is being very aggressive in calling it as well. Um, in, uh, in doing this through proxies at limited cost, in ways that are reasonably deniable, because it had, obviously, a much more immediate uh, duty to defend Iran against the invader. One of the things that came out of that war, however, was the Revolutionary Guard Corps. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps came about as part of the Iran-Iraq War as an elite fighting force, and as the war ended, the question became, what do they do with this fighting force that they have created and which proved itself quite effectively uh, during the Iran-Iraq War? And the answer was, this would now be a separate and parallel military component answerable directly to the Supreme Leader, not to the head of the army, not to the Minister of Defense, but to the Supreme Leader himself, and the purpose of this entity would be to defend the revolution. To defend the revolution. You would have a besiege militia whose uh, goal is to defend the revolution at home, domestically. And you would have the Quds Force as an entity whose job would be directly through its own activities, as we've seen very recently here in Europe with several recent Iranian assassination attempts, 
in different European capitals around the world, uh, through its own activities and through its partnership with proxies, trying to export this revolution. Not through direct conflict. You would not see the Iranian military, neither the military itself nor the IRGC military directly engaging foreign forces, except perhaps in, in unique circumstances. Maybe the type we're seeing today, we don't quite know. The events that have happened this week, landings of ships in the Gulf, uh, it's not clear that that was Iran. But if it was, it would fit with some of the things that we've seen the IRGC Navy do in the past. We'll have to reserve judgment on that, we just don't know. Um, the uh, drone attacks on Saudi oil installations by Houthi drones, that is something that we could describe as something being done by a group that to some level serves as a proxy of Iran. The Houthis are not entirely proxies of Iran, but in fact that's traditionally how Iranian proxies operate. They are their own groups. Lebanese Hezbollah is a Lebanese group. It cares about Lebanon. It participates in politics in Lebanon. It is also very much not only Lebanese. It is also very much an Iranian proxy. And so what Iran did is it built relationships of a transnational nature with proxies with whom it shared a core ideological shared belief. A belief in something that was unique to and a creation of the 1979 revolution. A new Shia Islamic theological precept, which many other Shia leaders, including some of the world's most high-ranking ayatollahs, such as Ayatollah Sistani in Iraq, who does not agree with this, their idea was Waliyat al-Faqih, the rule of the jurisprudence. Ayatollah Sistani rejects this. Ayatollah Fadlala, who used to be in Lebanon, did not accept this. But many do. Lebanese Hezbollah does. The Iraqi Shia militias do. To a certain extent, at least, clearly, the Houthi leadership does. And what it means is, effectively, that there is one mouthpiece for God on earth, and that person is today the Supreme Leader of Iran, who is not only the head of the country and the territory, the nation-state of Iran, but who is the leader of all Shia, and who therefore has a transnational obligation toward, a responsibility for Shia, who are seen often as the, the downtrodden around the world at a transnational level. And so you can have a group like Lebanese Hezbollah, which is Lebanese, and Iranian leadership and Iraqi groups. You can have today fighting with them in Syria, Pakistani Shia groups and Afghan Shia groups, and individual Shia in small numbers from Europe, the United States, Canada, South America, West Africa, the Gulf, going and fighting together in, in shared conflicts out of a sense, not of their national identity, which they have, but you can have more than one identity. Every single one of us has more than one identity. Out of a sense of transnational Shia identity. Now, not all Shia feel that way. There are different beliefs within this Shia sect of Islam. But among those who do subscribe to the principle of Waliyat al-Faqih, which is one of the guiding ruling principles of the Islamic Republic of Iran, it helps explain and understand the reason why the strength with which proxies, individuals, groups from other countries will be willing to work at the behest of Iran because they are not doing it at the behest of Iran, the nation state. They're doing it at the behest of Iran, Waliyat al Faqih. Now, even today, Iran believes at the revolutionary leadership level in the imperative, in the obligation to export this revolution. Does every Iranian government official believe this? I'm sure not. Do they all believe it to the same extent? I'm sure not. The same way almost every German official feels differently about something, American officials feel differently about something. But among the revolutionary leadership, this is a core unifying principle. And so the only question is how to do it. What's the timeline to do it?
take into account how Bahrain or Bahrain's allies, including Europe and the United States and others, might react to that, how the Gulf Cooperation Council, how the Sunni Gulf states in general might react to that, or do you go as much as you can anytime you can? You could ask yourself, by the way, a similar question about the West. Previous administrations in the United States wanted to deal with the threat from Iran as well, but I would argue we're much more attuned to balancing these questions. Whereas I would argue that the current administration, the Trump administration, is of the opinion the maximum pressure campaign that if there's something you can do, you do it. Just go. You can do it. Let's see. Just as a stated objective of that nation, the destruction of another country, another United Nations member. That's not acceptable. The provision of weapons, the training in terrorist tactics and military tactics, the provision of funds to groups that engage in terrorism against other countries, whether it's Israel or Gulf states, to some extent the Europe and the United States, that's not okay. I'm not saying that you have to completely agree with an American or a European or a Saudi position against Iran. I'm not saying that you don't recognize that Iran has legitimate interests. Of course they do. We need to take into account Iran's threat perception. That Iran-Iraq war has scarred the Iranian people in a way that a terrible, terrible war would scar any people. An entire generation of people. Everybody knows someone who was killed or injured. There were chemical weapons that were used. And from an Iranian perspective, the West supported Iraq. Of course, Iran then started carrying out attacks, targeting French, American, other interests because of that. But you have to understand their threat perception. You can understand that when the international community built a coalition to target Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan after 9-11. And then the US administration under the Bush administration also decided to uh, go to war in Iraq. So now that Iran has enemies, or at least countries that it doesn't feel comfortable with, fighting on either side, you can understand, I hope, Iran's threat perception. I mean, we have to be able to appreciate how that must feel. But while that doesn't mean that we have to accept that as a legitimate means of pursuing its interests, even legitimate interests, even legitimate threat perceptions, that it can do things like provide rockets, weapons to others around the region to do things that are clearly in violation of international norms, international law, often UN Security Council resolutions. The US and many of its partners decided over the past couple of years to try and put together a demonstration so that people could actually see, you could actually go and touch what we're talking about. And so it's not open to the public, like a public museum, but if you are in touch with the US government, you can have the opportunity, and I've gone, to visit Bowling Air Force Base, which is just outside, it's actually technically part of Washington, D.C., where there is now something called the Iran Munitions Display. The Iran Munitions Display is a collection of weaponry from Iran, and you can study and you can see the Iranian markings and the Iranian companies that produce them, that were collected 
in different places around the world. In Yemen, rockets that were fired into Saudi Arabia, in Afghanistan, in Bahrain, I'm sure I'm leaving out some other countries. We're talking about things like rockets that are as long as the width of this room, that are broken down into thirds so that they can be easily smuggled, and then you can see the soldering marks where they, they soldered these together back into one piece. These are ballistic missiles, medium range ballistic missiles with a significant payload. Some of these were intercepted on, at the sea. Some of these were actually fired, and so what you see is the remnants of this rocket. You can see unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, that were uh, captured in Yemen and in Afghanistan. Again, some of them for intelligence collection only, some of them with actual payloads, explosive payloads, to, uh, for a kind of kamikaze uh, you know, crash attack. Um, Iran recently has tried to engage directly in conflict with Israel, not only doing it through proxies, but from its position in Syria, where it now has bases, firing rockets into Israel, or flying a drone. Uh, they didn't capture, or at least they haven't made public that drone, uh, which was shot down, but that drone also had an explosive payload on it. And you can imagine what would happen if, God forbid, that had hit something. Uh, and Israel, I'm sure, would have felt the need to respond. You see how kind of aggressive the Iranian uh, mentality is in terms of pursuing these interests. This munitions display contains small arms, it contains grenades, a whole bunch of things, but perhaps what was most interesting, <clears throat> maybe I should say most disturbing, and maybe most relevant to this week, though I want to stress again, I have no special knowledge, and I am not claiming that the ramming attacks in the Gulf this week were done by Iran, we don't know. But the issue has been, it, it raises tensions in the Gulf. And one of the things that was most disturbing there <clears throat> was a copy of a small boat that the Iranians uh, took and built onto it a computer system where the boat can be remotely piloted, almost like a video game that you might play on your televisions in your home or your dorm room, and can carry an explosive payload. One of these boats actually did, two years ago, crash into a Saudi naval vessel, nearly sinking it, causing a very large hole in the hull of the boat. When they captured this particular model that is now on display on this Air Force base in Washington, D.C., they obviously uh, captured the computer system. Well, the Iranians hadn't deleted the database. <clears throat> there were two particularly interesting sets of data that they found on this hard drive. One was GPS locations. So you could see all the different places where this boat had gone on both of Yemen's coasts, um, a variety of different places where the Houthis are operating. But then it was also brought back to Iran, apparently for testing. And what was even more interesting is that it included video feed. It is programmed to be able to optically, with an electronic eye, see where it's going so that you can navigate it. Well, apparently, at some points, other than when it was in the water, the optical function was on. Including at one point when it was in the place where it was being uh, refurbished. And you can actually see the video of Iranian technicians. You can see the actual IRGC baseball caps that's sitting on his desk. And you can see boxes of similar components, um, some, not in the box, you can see the similar components for similar systems that they built in an effort to be able to have the capability to do things in the Gulf should that, be, uh, should that be their interest. So when it comes to Iran, at the end of the day, my message to you is twofold. You need to really understand in a levels of analysis what Iran is as a government, the different levels of analysis in that government, at a minimum the two parallel types of government, you need to be able to have an understanding of the inherent tension between Iran's 
governance. It, it is a government. It does engage in governance, especially the pseudo elected piece. And what makes it unique is continued and ongoing ideological commitment to export its revolution to places that don't necessarily want it. And to do so through violent means. Not only violent means. Iran won't engage in violence just for the sake of violence, but they have no problem engaging in violence if that's the best way to achieve their goals, on the one hand. And the second is the very, very broad extent of this activity. In places as far afield as Afghanistan and the Gulf states, in Lebanon, in Syria, of course, targeting Israel, now directly but traditionally through proxies, the idea that there is a nation state that is accepted among the family of nations, even as it is leading, training, providing weapons, providing money to groups that are engaging in terrorism and acts of instability in other sovereign nation states is not an acceptable situation in the international norms we have today. And so that is the issue that the international community has with Iran. Now, you may say to me, and I frankly hope at least one of you does, it would be ridiculous if you don't, hint, hint. What about the mistakes that America has made? Or that other coalition partners or, or Europe has made? What about the fact that the Trump administration pulled out of the JCPOA, the Iran deal? None of this is one-sided, right? I would argue that America's mistakes in the region are inherently by definition different than what Iran is doing, and I'm happy to explain, but that doesn't mean that America hasn't done things that have led to very bad consequences. And it doesn't mean that that doesn't contribute to Iran's sense of its threat perception. It, it must, it does. This is not a one-sided issue. But it does mean that we need to understand the ways in which Iran presents unique threats. And so we have today concerns about Iran in terms of the nuclear program. We have concerns about Iran, and maybe we need to caveat that because of where the JCPOA is or isn't, we can discuss. We have concerns about Iran's ballistic missile program, program which is a matter of international consensus, still subject to United Nations Security Council resolutions. We have a concern about Iran's sponsorship of terrorism, its direct involvement in terrorism, and its sponsorship of terrorism on the part of other proxy groups, still under international sanction. We have concerns about its human rights problems. When I was in the U.S. government, and we would have negotiations with our European partners on this, you could usually get them concerned about Iran's nuclear prol proliferation. Sometimes it was difficult to get them animated on the issue of Iran's support for terrorism. But if you showed a European official, I'm here in Germany, so let's say a German official, a picture of an Iranian dissident being hung to death, hanging from a European manufactured crane, that would get people's attention. And now we have other issues. Iran's activities in support of Houthis in Yemen, Iran's activities in support of the Assad regime in Syria. I think most people forget, or maybe they never knew, that the Assad regime has killed about 15 times more people than the Islamic State. The Islamic State was horrific and barbaric and an international, a threat to international security. I would argue that the Assad regime is as well. And that so long as the Assad regime remains in power, we're going to have a, a, a parallel threat of foreign fighters because Assad is in power. Iran's support of the Assad regime Iran's support of Shia militias active not only in Iraq but elsewhere is a huge problem. The fact that Ir Iran has now provided Iranian missiles to Iraqi Shia militias in Iraq, in western Iraq, that can be used by these Iraqi militias to fire rockets at the Saudis, at the Israelis, at whoever, they are not in control of the Iraqi government is a little bit mind-boggling. Iran is deploying medium-range ballistic missiles to a second country. Those missiles are in control not of the country, but of militant groups that are loyal not to Iraq, but to Iran. Not all the Shia militias are loyal to Iran over Iraq, but
when I'm talking about some of them are, Asa'i Bala Haq, Katayfus Bala, etc. It is a mind-boggling situation. And so that's what presents unique challenges. Now I'm hoping some of you are going to ask me about the JCPOA. I'm hoping we can get into what the JCPOA did cover and what it didn't cover. I'm hoping you'll give me an opportunity to tell you what parts of the JCPOA I thought were deeply flawed, and yet why at the same time I felt very strongly, and my advice to the Trump administration when they called me in to give them a briefing was not to leave the JCPOA. As you can see, they didn't listen to me, not the first time. But why I thought that even though the JCPOA was flawed, we should have stayed into it, in it, and what we should have done, even as we stayed in the JCPOA. In other words, let's have a conversation, not only about the problems with Iran, but about where the international community, where the United States is on these issues. This is a holistic discussion. But I think what we need to understand at the end of the day is the way that the Iranian government is unique among nation states parallel governing entities and one that is interested more in revolution than in governance and in revolution not only at home but more to the port outside of its borders and b that the way it does this is primarily through support of proxies who can do things with Or someone else. This is a unique challenge set. Now, maybe it's become more complicated because of the actions of the United States or others in the international community. Let's have that discussion. So, I, I want to I thank you very much for the kind of introduction. I want to thank you all for taking the time uh, during your lunch to come and hear my few thoughts. And I really, really hope we can engage in conversation. So, let's have that. Thank you very much.